Welcome back. As we continue our discussion of direct products of groups, we should talk about some basic facts about these groups. Let's suppose that you're dealing with the group G1, direct product G2, direct product, and so on, all the way through the direct product Gn, where each of these is a group. Now, in the last video, we talked about the elements of this group. We said that they were n-tuples, where each entry of that tuple was an element from the corresponding group. What that means then is that the set of elements of the direct product is the Cartesian product of the sets of elements of each individual group. And the number of ways to fill out an n-tuple accordingly is the product of the orders of each of the groups. We'll have the order of G1 ways we can fill out the first entry. We'll have the order of G2 number of choices to fill out the second entry and so on, all the way up through the order of Gn, number of ways we can fill out the last entry in an n-tuple from the direct product. Now, we mentioned in the last video that you should go ahead and try to prove that the direct product of, of groups is a group, but let's talk about some of the details you'll run into. As we said in the last video, if you have the identity of G1 direct product, G2 direct product, all the way through G direct product Gn, you would be looking at an element of the form E1, E2, all the way through En, where EI is the identity of group I. Taking the identity of each of these groups and putting all those identities in order in an n-tuple gives you the identity of the direct product. What about inverses now? Well, to take the inverse of an element in the direct product, since we operate entry-wise when we put two of these n-tuples together, we're able to find the inverse by just taking the inverse of each entry. And you'll see that if you were to put this entry together with the original G1, G2 through Gn, you'll create the identity we've already identified. Now, how about the orders of elements in a group? There's a theorem here we won't prove, but you are encouraged to take a look at proving it yourself. For any element of the direct product, the order of the element g1, g2 through gn, will equal the least common multiple of the orders of g1, the order of g2, and so on, up through the order of gn. What I can do to find the, the order of the element is take a look at the orders of each entry and find their least common multiple. Now let's apply that in a couple of examples. So z2, direct product z2, direct product z3, is a group of order 12. The order of element 101 is equal to 6. Let's talk about why. As I take a look here at the entry 1, I know that that comes from the group Z2, and that entry 1 has order 2 in the group Z2. The element of orders, the element 0 has order 1 in Z2, and this one comes from the group Z3, where it has order 3. So as I take a look at the orders of each individual entry, this one had order 2, this one had order 1, this one had order 3. The least common multiple of 2, 1, and 3 turns out to be 6, which explains why this element has order 6. Now, if you're interested, go ahead and put this element together with itself six times using the operation of this direct product, and you'll see that this does, in fact, have that order. You'll also get some insight into why the least common multiple is the, the correct order. Uh, for the element. Over here, let's take the direct product of the dihedral group of order 4. These are the uh, symmetries of the square and the symmetric group of the elements 1, 2, and 3. Remember, these are the permutations uh, using elements 1, 2, and 3. An element of that direct product might look something like this, R90, comma, the transposition 1, 2. To find the order of such an element, I'll take the order of R90 in D4, and remember a 90 degree rotation is, has order 4 in that group, and remember that this uh, swap of 1 and 2 has order 2 as a permutation. The least common multiple of 4 and 2 is 4, and therefore the order of that element is order 4. Let's take a look at an exercise. How many elements of Z2 direct product Z2, direct product Z3, have order 6? And how many have order 2? If you're interested, go ahead and pause the video now and try to come up with an answer. 
either by reasoning or by actually listing the elements and figuring out what the orders are. So let's answer this question. Let's try to be systematic about it. We know that elements of z2 direct product z2 direct product z3 will be ordered triples. So we'll suppose that a is an element from z2, b is an element from z2, and c is an element from z3. Now an element like this will have order six in the direct product if and only if the least common multiples of the order of a, the order of b, and the order of c, if the least common multiple is equal to six. Now the elements of z2 can only have orders one or two, and the elements of z3 can only have order one or three by Lagrange's theorem. So we are sort of limited in how we can end up with a least common multiple equal to six. In fact, we must have that uh, the order of C is three. That's the only way to, to get a multiple of three is the least common multiple. And at least one of the order of A and the order of B has to equal two. Well, there are only certain elements in Z2 that have order two, and there's only certain elements in Z3 that have order three, so we have limited the, uh, the possibilities here. In fact, C has to be one or two. Both of those have order three in Z3. And B or A or both has to equal one. It's the only element of order two in Z2. So as I start looking at the ways of putting this together, keeping C as one or two, remember C is our last entry, and having A or B or both be one, we'll end up with these possibilities. You've got two choices for what C is, and you have three choices for what's going on in the entries A and B. So there turn out to be six um, entries in the direct product that have order six. Now moving on, how many have order two? If you haven't paused the video yet, you might try that now. Well, let's go ahead and answer that. Let's suppose that we have an entry, let's call it X, Y, Z to keep straight the difference between this and the previous problem. In order for x, y, z to have order two, we need the least common multiple of the orders of the entries x and y and z to be two, and therefore the order of x or the order of y or both has to be two, and the order of z has to equal one because we can't have it be three and end up with two as our order. Well, that tells us that the only elements that can have this happen have either one or zero, in the first two entries, but at least one of them needs to be one. And the last entry has to be one. And so we end up with three such elements, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, and one, one, one. Well, as we've been talking about orders, you might start to wonder when the direct product is cyclic. When is it that you'll have an element in your direct product that has the same order as the entire group? When would that be true for just two groups, or when would it be true if you had a direct product of more than two groups? Is it possible that those are cyclic? Well, here's a theorem that will answer it for us. Again, we're going to omit the proof here, but you should try it. It's really not that bad. If G and H are finite cyclic groups, then the group G direct product H is cyclic if and only if the order of G and the order of H are relatively prime. As a corollary to that theorem, we can talk about what happens if you have more than two groups in your direct product. If G1 through Gn are all finite cyclic groups, then their external direct product will be cyclic if and only if the order of Gi and the order of Gj are relatively prime for every pair of different i and j you can choose from one and n. Now, our favorite cyclic groups are the integers mod n for different values of n. So we'll take that idea that the external direct product is cyclic if and only if the orders of the entries, uh, the orders of the groups involved are relatively prime. This will tell us that for integers mod n1, n2, and nk, and everything in between, the external direct product of these will be congruent or isomorphic to z n1 n2 dot 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 nk. In other words, this direct product will be isomorphic to the cyclic group having uh, 
the same number of elements. If and only if these subscripts ni and nj are relatively prime whenever i is not equal to j. So let's take a look at how we might apply this. It's also important to keep in mind that you can say this the other way around. You can take any cyclic group and you can break it down into smaller cyclic groups if you take a look at how to factor that in such a way that the different numbers in your factorization end up being relatively prime to each other. Well, here's an example of a, a larger external direct product, Z2 direct product Z3, uh, direct product uh, Z2, two copies of Z2 direct product with Z3. If we take a look at the ordered triples and we start looking at patterns, you'll see that we do have some diagonal stripes, but not all uh, not every diagonal heading from the bottom left to the upper right is a uh, diagonal stripe with all the same elements. So this group does not look at first glance like it has to be cyclic. And in fact, if you were to ask if it were cyclic, you might take a look at these external direct product factors, the Z2, the Z2, and the Z3, and remember our rule. This external direct product will be cyclic if and only if the subscripts are relatively prime. Since 2 and 2 are not relatively prime, this group would not be isomorphic to Z12, the cyclic group having the same number of elements. Now, on the other hand, take a good look here, and maybe the color coding will help a little bit. If we were to take Z2, direct product Z2, direct product Z3, and if we were to compare its Cayley table with Z2, direct product Z6, you'll see that there are some definite correspondences. The patterns between the two tables are very apparent, and so it looks like Z2, direct product Z6 should be isomorphic to Z2, direct product Z2, direct product Z3. And that makes sense. You'll notice that if we were to just talk about Z6, Z6 will be isomorphic to Z2 direct product Z3 because 2 and 3 are relatively prime. So we can take Z2 and Z3 and put them together to get Z6 as an isomorphic group. And if I were to focus just on that part of my external direct product, I'll end up getting an isomorphism between these two larger groups. Now, on the other hand, we can say that Z2 direct product Z6 is not the same thing as Z4 direct product Z3. One easy way to say that is that the latter is isomorphic to Z12. Because 4 and 3 are relatively prime, this theorem above says that these two together would make a group isomorphic to Z12. This group is not isomorphic to Z12, so they certainly can't be isomorphic to each other. Well, it's often very nice to express groups as a direct product or isomorphic to a direct product of smaller, simpler groups. Um, you can think about taking a, a group and almost factoring it, breaking it down into smaller groups like we factor integers. Now, just like happens when you factor an integer into uh, primes, you can answer some questions a lot more simply. For instance, I could take a look at 276 and I could instantly know whether 7 divided it evenly or whether the square root of this is an integer if I was able to look at the prime factors. Now in the same way, knowing how a group can be broken down as a smaller, as a direct product of smaller groups will help us to answer certain questions a lot more easily. Now let's take a look at that table of groups again. These are the, the finite groups of orders 1 through 31. Let's highlight a few things we might have uh, noticed along the way. In an earlier video, we talked about these rows that have two groups. Now, some of them were already explained away. We know that if your group order is two times a prime, the two groups that you might end up with are either the cyclic group or the dihedral group with the, uh, the appropriate orders. But there were some rows that we had not explained. In particular, Groups of order four, we now know what those look like. There are two of them, and they end up looking like C4 and C2 cross C2, or as we would say, Z4 and Z2 direct product Z2. Z9 has just two groups. Um, 
groups of order 9 involve just two groups, Z9 and Z3, direct product Z3. And if I take a look at Z20, or if I take a look at groups of order 25, there are just two of them, Z25 and Z20, Z5, direct product Z5. Now, groups of order 21 are a little bit different. There are two groups of that order. One is the cyclic group we're used to. The other is a non-abelian group. You might read the Math World article if you want to learn more about that group. But for these other rows, it looks like something's happening, particularly when you're dealing with a square order. 4 and 9 and 25 are all square numbers. And in fact, they are squares of primes. 4 is 2 squared, 9 is 3 squared, 25 is 5 squared. Is it true, could it be true, that whenever you have a group whose order is the square of a prime, there will always be just two groups, both of them abelian, both of them isomorphic to either the cyclic group of that order or the external direct product of two copies of the uh, cyclic group of the prime order involved? That's a question that, to wonder about. Another question, maybe a more basic question, will arise if you just take a look at what happens in the abelian column of this table. In every row, we either have a just a cyclic group, or we end up with more than one group. But when we do end up with more than one group, they seem to all be direct products of groups. Will this continue? Is this something that only happens in the first 31 rows of the table? Or will that be true for all orders? Is every finite abelian group isomorphic to an external direct product of cyclic groups? And here's our question from a few minutes ago. Is it true that all groups of order p squared where p is prime must be of the form zp squared or zp direct product zp? Well, these are interesting questions. We'll see if we can answer them before the course ends. Now, in the next video, we're going to take a look at another certain kind of group, the group of units, u of n. We'll see you there.